Same price. All right, this is good. Okay, good morning. We still have a few folks coming in, but y'all, we have got so much to cover. It's 9.52. We've got to dive into this lesson today. Thanks so much for coming back. You're here. Week two. How'd it go? Yeah? Good. How, how did discussion groups go today? Yeah? Good. Good. Well, I've been so encouraged and challenged by my study this week, and I hope that you have been too. I'm eager for us to dive into this passage together. So let me pray for us, and we will jump right in. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these women who are here to learn, who are here to grow deeper in relationship with each other, relationship with you. I just thank you for what you've taught us through these couple of chapters of Matthew this week. Lord, I just pray this even now as we just look back on all we've learned and summarize some of the big truths that you've taught us. I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts. I pray that you would help me to speak clearly and confidently what you've put on my heart to share with these women. And Lord, I just pray above all else that we would just know you better. So Lord, we give you this time. We pray that you'd use it for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's jump back to the first part of our study. And so, you know, we talked last week about our active learning environment. So we are at stage three. All week, you've been studying these couple of chapters on your own. You've just talked about them around your tables. And so now I'm just going to summarize what we've already talked about just as one final review before we then dive into what's next in Matthew chapter 16. So go back in your Bible or your journal or however you're following along to Matthew chapter 13, verse 53. I told you last week, I think this is the largest chunk of scripture we will have to tackle in one week. And so I'll just go ahead and do my disclaimer. We are not going to get to all of it today in our teaching time, okay? Okay. But I'm going to try to hit some of the big truths and some of the big things that I think are so key for us to understand as we continue on through this book of Matthew. But a few of these sections I'm just going to do a quick summary of, and I'm going to start that with the end of chapter 13. At the end of chapter 13, we see Jesus teaching in his hometown, and we see kind of the the chapter that, the, the way that the workbook titled this chapter was Rejection. And we really see that right at the beginning, don't we? We see Jesus back in his hometown with people who had watched him grow up. And we see them hear him teach. And instead of seeing Jesus and saying, wow, we never knew this was the Messiah. Can you believe it? The guy that we used to play ball with and change his diapers and saw him walk home from school like, he's the Messiah. They didn't respond that way, did they? They said, we know this guy. Who in the world does he think he is? Marching in here, pretending like he's the Messiah. And the Bible tells us that they did not believe him. But instead, that Jesus did not do many miracles there in his own hometown for one specific reason. They didn't believe him. They didn't have faith. And so we start off our study this morning with just this heaviness and not a bright, beautiful, cheery, fun music playing kind of start to our story, but um, these people who had known Jesus his whole life didn't believe him. And so the Bible tells us that he moved on. And chapter 14 now starts with this part of the story. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, and at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus. This is John the Baptist. He told his servants, he has been raised from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, we've heard about a Herod before, haven't we? At the very beginning of our story, do you remember we learned about a Herod? That was Herod the Great, who had heard that Jesus was born and that the wise men had called him king of the Jews. And that Herod had thought that Jesus was a threat, and so he tried to kill him and ended up killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem. This isn't the same guy. Because you remember at the end of that part of the story, Mary and Joseph waited until that Herod had died 
And then they were able to go back home and be, be in a safer place. But this is that Herod's son. And so now this Herod we are introduced to, and he's called Herod the Tetrarch. He's not the, the big in charge of everything king, but he's in charge of a certain portion of the land, a certain portion of the people. And we meet Herod the Tetrarch who says, here's about what Jesus is doing, and says, this is John the Baptist. And why was that scary? Well, because, and again, we'll just kind of quickly summarize this, but Herod had killed John the Baptist in kind of a strange situation, wasn't it? He had arrested John because of his teaching, and then we read about how through some strange situations, he beheaded John, brought his plate to the, his head to the party on a platter, and so that was in the past. And so now Herod is getting these reports about this man who is teaching powerfully, who's doing these amazing miracles. And his first thought was, the guy that I killed is back from the dead, and this is bad news for me. And so Herod was frightened when he heard this. And it gives us the story that we missed about how John the Baptist ended up dying. And so in verse 12, Matthew continues, and, and after this had happened, the Bible says, then his, John's disciples came and removed the corpse, buried it, and went and reported to Jesus. Do you remember the last time John's disciples had come and reported to Jesus? Do you remember this? Do you remember when John was first put in prison and he was hearing about what Jesus was doing, but it wasn't exactly even what John the Baptist thought? And so John the Baptist from prison sends his disciples to Jesus, and the disciples' encounter with Jesus was so beautiful and full of mercy and full of understanding and compassion. And they had gone back and taken this message to John. And as far as we know, this is the very next time that they come to Jesus. And this time they're coming to say, he's gone. He's been killed. And they give that report to Jesus. And verse 13 says, and when Jesus heard about it, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. Was this touching to you? It was touching to me. Jesus hears this news about John, and he knows why John had been killed, because John was proclaiming the truth of Jesus' gospel. And he was in prison, and he was killed. And the Bible gives us this picture of Jesus. And remember, one of our key themes is, what do we learn about Jesus through this? And we see in this part of the passage such a glimpse of Jesus and his humanity. Jesus was fully God, and he was also fully man. And he hears this news, and the Bible says he retreats by himself to be by himself. Verse 13, though, continues and says, But when the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he had compassion on them. And the Bible says that he healed their sick. So what do we learn about Jesus here? He was compassionate. He was compassionate on these people for what they needed. And I want to remind you of this. And I'm going to try to, I'm, this is something that I am trying to remind myself of. And so I want to say this to you all too. But throughout the Gospel of Matthew, I want to remind you when we see these kind of characteristics of Jesus, when we see Jesus looking on people who had a need and responding to that need with compassion, we have to know that whatever we see in Jesus is also true of God the Father. Jesus is the visible representation of God. He is God himself. And so when we see this compassion in Jesus, don't miss the fact that that also shows us that God the Father is compassionate. He's compassionate on us in our needs Verse 15, and when evening came, the disciples approached him and said, this place is deserted and it's already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. They don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. But we have only five loaves and two fish here, they said to him. One of the commentaries that I read had such a cool note on this, so I copied and pasted it, and I wanted to read it to you. Uh, Leon Morris says, the disciples had put forward their evidence of this meager supply as a way of indicating the impossibility of their doing anything. 
but Jesus thinks of it as the basis for action. Isn't that good? When I read that this week, I was reminded of one of my kind of spiritual heroes is Hudson Taylor. Are you familiar with Hudson Taylor? He was a missionary in the 1800s, and he founded an organization called China Inland Mission. And he wrote this book, and I brought it today, and it was fun to look back through, but he wrote, well, his son wrote this book called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. And I read this when I was in college, and it's been one of those books that has kind of shaped me throughout different seasons of my life. In fact, it shaped me so much that I have this sitting on my kitchen counter. So I dusted it off and got all the grease splatters off so I could bring it in to show you today. It sits right by my stove. But one of the things, this, this was a quote from Hudson Taylor. He said this when he was a missionary in China. He said, we have this and all the promises of God. And that quote is from an excerpt of a letter that he wrote to his wife. And I just want to read it to you because this passage reminded me of many, many years later, a man of faith who walked much this way. So the book says, a note to Mrs. Taylor of about the same time, which was April 1874, said this, the balance, so this is finances, the balance in hand yesterday was 87 cents. The Lord reigns. Herein is our joy and our rest. And to Mr. Baller, he added, when the balance was still lower, we have this and all the promises of God. And I love that. And I was reminded when I was reading that this week, boy, how many times do I put my weaknesses up to the Lord and say, see, We can't do this, God. See? Look how weak I am. Look how nothing I am. This is all the reason in the world why we can't move forward with this plan. But what the disciples in this story put before Jesus as proof that nothing could be done, Jesus said, that's perfect. That weakness, that teeny tiny little bit is exactly what I need to do this beautiful work for the glory of the Father. What's the weakness that you have that you're putting up to the Lord as an excuse that instead you need to offer to him to use in whatever way he wants to show his mighty glory? And if you need a good book to read, Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret is a great book. Put it on your list. Here's what Jesus says in response to them. Verse 18, he says, bring them here to me. And then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took five loaves and two fish And looking up to heaven, he blessed them, and he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and everyone ate and was satisfied. And they picked up 12 baskets full of the leftover pieces. Now those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. So what's going on here? This again, this is an example of Jesus' compassion, right? There were 5,000 plus people in front of him who were hungry, who needed something to eat. But don't miss this. Jesus didn't have to do this miracle. When the disciples said, let's just send them away to find something to eat, that was actually a really good suggestion. Like that could have worked. There was nothing that said in this specific story, yeah, that's not a good idea. They could have done that. But Jesus chose to meet this need a different way. Why did he choose to do that? Jesus was providing it. It is an example of his compassion, but there's so much more going on here as part of this story because what was Jesus trying to do? What is Matthew trying to do through his gospel? Do you remember? One of Matthew's whole purposes in writing this gospel is to show his readers and show us today that this Jesus is, is the one who was prophesied from long ago, who is coming today to fulfill those prophecies as the Messiah. And so don't miss that context in reading this story. Because in the Old Testament, there was something else that had happened. Yeah, there was some other story that every Jew that was in this audience would have immediately remembered when they saw what was happening. Because when Jesus did this miracle, he was pointing back to when God, 
Yahweh God, the true God of Israel, was bringing his people out of slavery of the, in Egypt into the promised land. And while they were on their journey, they got hungry. And they started worrying about what they would eat. And what did God do? God provided manna from heaven, miraculously, consistently, compassionately. He provided food for his people in a way that not only met their needs, but showed his incredible power and his incredible sovereignty. And so Jesus in this situation is showing that just like the Israelites in the wilderness were provided for by God, so I, Jesus, God, am providing for you today. Jesus is using this miracle to show his own power and sovereignty and holiness as the Son of God. And so this miracle doesn't just point to, boy, he was compassionate and he didn't want him to be hungry, true. But he also said, I want to show you who I am. I want you to see that I'm the fulfillment of all that was prophesied. Look at verse 22. After he does this, the Bible says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him on the other side while he dismissed the crowds. See, he wasn't even going to keep teaching for hours and hours. Like, they could have gone home. They could have gone to the town. He didn't have to feed them, but he did. And as soon as they were done eating, he sends his disciples away. And then he says, great, meal's over. It's time to go home. And he sends the crowds away. And the Bible says that at, after dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And well into the night, he was there alone. I don't want you to miss what this day has been for Jesus. You remember what this day has been? You remember how this day started? Early in the morning, he found out that John the Baptist had been murdered. And so he went by himself to grieve. And then he came out of that to crowds and crowds of people, needy, hungry, clamoring people. And he had compassion on them and he healed them all day long. And then when evening came and his disciples said, let's just clock out, let's get them away from here, he feeds them miraculously. And that took some time. When we were, we, we've, if you're part of Storyline, you know we've tried 84 different kinds of communion. And almost every time we try a new kind of communion, you know what we do? We get as many staff members as possible in here sitting in a row and we time how long does it take to do this method of communion. And so I know how long it takes to feed 18 staff members communion in multiple different ways. And so I can tell you with experience, it takes a long time to feed 5,000 plus people. And so this was an exhausting, exhausting day for Jesus. And at the end of the day, what did he do? What did he turn to at the end of his day? What was the desire of his heart? What was that stirring all throughout his day? I can't wait till I get to the end of my day because, and for Jesus it was, I can't wait to be with God in prayer. Is there anything more convicting to you? Who this convicted me? Because I'll tell you, I have days like this. And I know some of you in this room are like, this is my life. Waking up early morning to some sort of emotional something. Caring for people who need me all throughout the day. Laid into the night. And the desire of my heart all throughout the day is something else. <laughs> there's the next episode. There's this thing I'm reading. There's this thing I want to eat. There's this whatever this is what I'm working for at the end of my day. And what did Jesus long for at the end of an exhausting day? He just wanted to be with God in prayer. I have prayed for me this week, and I've prayed for you, that the Lord would show us how much he is the true refreshment at the end of our day. He is the true reward at the end of serving small people or large people or whoever you serve throughout the day, that at the end of our day, to spend those last few moments letting our desires be fulfilled in him and in his presence. Man, what a beautiful example that is for us. So this, this is where Jesus has been, and he's just had this time. And verse 24 says, Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. And that word batter is tormented. Like this was a serious storm. 
Verse 25, Jesus came toward them walking on the sea very early in the morning. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, the Bible says they were terrified. Were they terrified of the wind? Not so much. They were terrified of this, what do they call him? They say, this is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. And verse 27, and this is the theme of our passage, immediately Jesus spoke to them and he said, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And the language here, and it'd be weird if they translated it this way, but the language here in the Greek is literally this, have courage, I am, don't be afraid. And so Jesus, in the midst of this storm and in the midst of after this incredibly busy day, he calls out to his disciples and he's walking on the water of all things. And he says to them, have courage. And if there was a teeny tiny pause, you could almost see the disciples saying, have courage. How? How can we have courage right this minute? This is a terrible storm. We're being tormented. Why in the world would you encourage us to have courage? And then Jesus answers immediately and he says, because I am. And those disciples, again, with all of their cultural knowledge and all that they had learned from the Old Testament, what did those two words signify for every single Jewish person of that time? Yahweh, the one true God of Israel, the all-powerful, almighty, all-sovereign God, and Jesus was saying to them, have courage. You know why? Because I'm God and I'm here. Don't be afraid. And what we're seeing throughout this book of Matthew is that Jesus is more and more and more boldly declaring with conviction and boldness and power, I am God. I'm the Messiah. And I love that in this passage, and there's something here for us, y'all. I love that in this passage, he doesn't say, have courage because I'm going to fix your problem. Because here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to solve it. He said, you know what the only thing you need to know is? I am. And I don't know what your storm is, and I don't know what your problem is. We could spend a lot of time here, couldn't we? But here's what you need to know. I am. And the Bible says that then Peter, in verse 28, he says to, he says to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And this phrase is a little bit, like it can go either way. But the, but the phrase here is not that Peter is saying, is it really you? Let me test you. Let me see if it's really you. He's not saying that. He's saying, if it's you, more since it is you, like, yeah, it is you, Lord. And since I believe that, help me do what you're doing right now. And what does Jesus do? Jesus says, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid. Had Jesus calmed the storm yet? No. Peter was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, again that word, immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And then those in the boat worshiped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. Who is in the boat? It's his disciples. And did you know this is the first time that we kind of know now they've made their choice now too? We have seen over the past several chapters that crowds and small groups of people and leaders and poor people and people who were sick and people who were well, now all these people were faced with the decision, who do you believe Jesus is? And they had to choose. But up until this point, we haven't gotten insight into Jesus' disciples until right now that they say, Truly, you are the son of God. And what was different for the disciples about this time? Because remember, they've been there the whole time. They've heard Jesus teaching. They've seen him heal. They just saw him provide food for 5,000 plus people. But this was now personal to them. 
they had seen Jesus up close, not doing something for somebody else, but revealing who he was to them personally. And they say, truly, you are the son of God. Verse 34, when they'd crossed over, they came to the shore at Genezaret, maybe. When the, women, when the men that place, at that place recognized him, they alerted the whole vicinity and brought to him all who were sick. And they begged him that they might only touch the end of his robe. And as many as touched it were healed. So Jesus went to his hometown and they said, who do you think you are? We don't believe what you're saying is true. And Jesus left and didn't do many things there. And he goes to this brand new other town. And the reception is so different. They believe him. They have faith in him. They're like, even if we just kind of brush past you, Jesus, we're going to be healed. That's how much faith we have in you. What a contrast to what we've seen. Verse, or chapter 15, then Jesus was approached by Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem who asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. Does this strike you as funny? These are their big things going on right now. Big things, really big things. And the scribes and the Pharisees come and they say, we have a really important question. Why do your, why do your disciples not wash their hands? It's kind of bothering us. It's kind of big. We need to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> and look at verse 3. The Bible says, he answered them. A question for a question here. He says, well, why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? And then he gives them an example of that. And in verse 8, he says, this people honors me with their lips Again, Matthew's pointing back to a prophecy about Jesus. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines, human commands. This is exactly in line with what Jesus has been saying from the very beginning, isn't it? This isn't new for us. Jesus is saying you're putting way too much emphasis on something that's outward, and you're forgetting about your heart. Verse 10, summoning the crowd then, he told them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Why? Because what comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart. And this is my favorite. Look at verse 12. And then the disciples came up and they told him, did you know that what you're saying is offending the Pharisees? Was this not funny to you? It's like, Jesus, you're not realizing something. Come here, come here. You're offending them. And he replied, every plant that my heavenly father didn't plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They're blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. What's he saying? Just, it's just not even worth it. Like, I'm not going to engage with these guys. I'm not going to argue with them. We're not going to argue with them to faith. It's not going to happen. They are the blind leading the blind. And y'all, in this day, this was like the ultimate of insults. Blind were helpless. And so he says, they're just, just let them be. Just don't even worry about it. And then 15 again. Y'all, if you're not encouraged by, how, by these disciples and how Jesus interacts with them, I mean, you need to be. Because here's what Peter then says. Peter says, hmm, and you can almost picture him. Here's how I picture Peter. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That's good. Tell us what you mean. <laughs> like he doesn't get it. He wants to get it. He wants to get it so bad. It's like, Peter, tell it to me like I'm five. Like, come on. I, uh, I want to get it. And Jesus says, do you still lack understanding? Five minutes ago, you were saying you are the son of God. And now here this has happened and you're still lacking understanding. And he said, don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and then is eliminated. But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And this defiles a person. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immorality, thefts, false testimony, slander. These are, not, these are the things that defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. So what's he saying? Here's what he's saying. 
if unwashed hands are the problem, like really and truly, if, if your hands being not washed was the ultimate of all problems, what's the solution to that? Wash your hands and we're done. Like we've solved the problem. And so the Pharisees were saying the most important thing is that you didn't wash your hands. Why? Because the solution was so easy and so controllable and something that could be easily solved. And what was Jesus saying? Your problem is not unclean hands. Your problem is an unclean heart. And that is not an easily solved problem. That is not something you can just say, I'll be right back taking care of this. Here I am. I'm back with a clean heart. What was the only way that someone could go from an unclean heart to a clean heart? Faith in Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus' mission was. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to save his people from their sins. And that was only something that Jesus could do. The Pharisees couldn't help at all, and they couldn't control it at all. And so Jesus was taking the perception that the problem, the biggest problem that the people had was something that the Pharisees could say, we've got your answer. Come to us. We can fix it. We can control it. We can solve it. He was totally taking that away, and he was saying, here's your real problem, and I'm the son of God, and I'm the only one that can help you. I'm the only one. And so the Pharisees stood by. And here's what Jesus was doing. He was taking away their control over the people. The Pharisees could no longer fix and control. And if they're anything like us, who I bet they love fixing and controlling. We love to fix and control, don't we? And Jesus was saying, that's not it. But guess what? I am. Verse 21, when Jesus left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon. And now this wasn't quick. This isn't like am the next day. This would have taken a few weeks, maybe even a few months to get there. So, so again, Matthew's picking out stories that he wants us to hear that can show us who Jesus is. Verse 22, just then a Canaanite woman from that region came and kept crying out, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. Did you see what she called Jesus? Son of David. She's a Gentile. And she calls him by his true name, by his true identity. She says, Jesus, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says Jesus did not say a word to her. And his disciples approached him and urged him, send her away because she's crying out after us. Now, they weren't saying just Send her away. But in the context and in the words that they use, it's more like, just heal her quickly. They just do what you do, Jesus. We've seen it for months and months. Just quickly heal her. Send her away because she's shouting after us. It's super annoying. Let's just, let's just get rid of this lady. And he replied, and this is interesting. He replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and she knelt before him. And she said, Lord, help me. And he answered, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Does this sound like Jesus? He just called this lady a dog. But think of what he's saying. And the word that's, the, that's dogs here, and because they're under the table, this was like a household pet. So he's saying, you don't feed your dog first. And your children are hungry. Of course you would never do that. And he's saying this a little bit, not maybe sarcastically, but a little bit like, doesn't everybody believe you feed your children and then your dogs? Like, isn't that obvious? And she says, and I really like her, don't you? She says, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus replied to her, woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was healed. Did you know that in the book of Matthew, this is the only time that Matthew records Jesus saying someone's faith was great? And it was this Gentile woman who was humble, but oh, she had faith. 
and she believed that Jesus had the power to heal. Verse 29, moving on from there, Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain, and he sat there. You remember we said at the beginning of Matthew, when Jesus sits down, it's a posture of teaching and authority. And so the Bible tells us that he healed all these crowds of people, and it gives us detail of the kind of healing that he did. And then in verse 32, it's almost like we missed a page and we went back to a story we've already read before, isn't it? Because now we're going to read about a very similar story of Jesus now feeding 4,000 people. Started with 5,000, now we're on to 4,000. But don't miss this. Jesus is still in the area of the Gentiles. And so when he does this miracle, when he fed the 5,000, that would have been a primarily Jewish audience, a Jewish crowd. And there would have been Gentiles scattered throughout, but primarily because of where it happened, Jesus was showing himself and his power and the fulfillment of prophecy to the Jewish people. But here now, he's in Gentile territory. And so he does almost the same thing. And even some of the language that's used, we get the picture that now this crowd is primarily Gentiles. Jesus is doing for the Gentile people what he had just done for the Jewish people. And in between those two things is this woman with the greatest faith that we hear about in the whole gospel. And so the story continues, and he does a very similar thing. And again, they had a little bit of food, and Jesus multiplies it. And he provides enough that there were seven, th seven baskets left over of the food that he had multiplied. Chapter 16, the Bible ends this, this section. We'll finish up here that the Pharisees and Sadducees approached him and tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. When they came and they were testing him, it wasn't like, we want to, we're kind of in between. We're just not sure yet, Jesus. Just show us one more thing. But they came to test him for like, this is going to be the time we really trip him up. We're going to do everything we can to prove Jesus wrong. There was nothing hopeful or good in their hearts. They were coming to Jesus to try to trip him up. And look what Jesus does in response. He says, when the evening comes, you say, it will be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the appearance, the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except for the sign of Jonah. So what's he saying? What had these Pharisees and Sadducees just seen over the past several months? Like, if that's not a sign, what is? Jesus had taught. He had healed. He had done all these things. And now the Pharisees and Sadducees come and say, hey, we just, just a quick favor. Can you just show us one thing to prove it to us? Just one thing. It's all we're asking for. One sign from heaven. And Jesus says, well... Here is the kind of generation that needs that. A wicked generation doesn't put their faith in him, but keeps asking, keeps asking. And he says, he says there's one more sign that's going to be a big one that you could take as the sign that's really going to show it to you, and it's the sign of Jonah. We're at the end of our time, but let's just talk about it for one minute. The sign of Jonah, he's already talked about this in Matthew chapter 12. What was the sign of Jonah? Well, Jonah was the prophet who had been swallowed by a giant fish, spent three days in that fish's belly and then was spit out, reappeared to the people and preached the kingdom of God, okay? And so Jesus is saying, so the sign of Jonah, it's coming and it's gonna be the ultimate way that you know that I'm the Messiah because you know what's gonna happen? I'm gonna be crucified. I'm gonna be in a tomb for three days and then I'm gonna reappear and proclaim again the good news. And he says, that sign is coming but it's not just going to be something I do just to answer your question and suit your fancy. But it's going to be the ultimate sign that I am the Messiah. And his disciples continue to have questions about this. And Jesus said, watch out for them. And again, they don't quite understand. But at the end of our passage, we see that they realized, verse 12, they realized, they understood that he had not told them to beware of the leaven and bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees.
And so the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two totally different streams of thought. They were so different, they often contradicted themselves. And so for Jesus to put these together tells us one thing. Jesus was saying, here's my teaching and here's everything else. If it's not mine, it's not true. And so as different as different beliefs can be, if it's not the truth of the gospel, don't even let it influence you at all. And that's what he's saying. The gospel, the gospel is the truth. Okay, so we've studied on our own. We've discussed around our tables. We've summarized again here. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Who might the Lord bring across your path this afternoon, tomorrow, this weekend, that you can now go and tell something that you've learned from this part of Matthew this week? Who is the Lord going to bring across your path? I've prayed for you this week that the Lord would give you boldness and courage and the right words to say. And y'all, it doesn't have to be fancy. Just say, can I tell you something interesting? Do, do, do. Isn't that interesting? Great. Tell somebody now this week something that the Lord has taught you, something that he's done in your life, and give glory to him because of it. This next week, our passage is so much smaller, so enjoy diving deep into these next several verses of the book of Matthew, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Let me pray for us, and we'll be done. Lord, please now take these words that are from your word and just cement them deep into our hearts and minds. Help us to to be more like you because of what we've studied here today, and do give us a person to tell, a person to encourage or challenge or just share with, Lord something that you have taught us from your word. We give that to you. We can't wait to see what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all have a good rest of your week.